Thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to just say a few words, and then, uh, and then I'll open it up for uh, some questions, um, comments. Um, no rhyme or reason here. Let me just say some, uh, talk about some things that are um, relevant, important, interesting about the elections that we just went through. Um, this was the first election in decades, probably, two or more decades, where the focus of attention wasn't on Northern Virginia. Um, it has been the case for the last couple of decades that the politics of Northern Virginia, the electoral politics of Northern Virginia has sort of driven the conversation about what's going on in the Commonwealth. Um, what's happened over the last couple of decades is that Northern Virginia has slowly um, become a sea of blue. And uh, the only, um, the only, uh, ra the only, there were only two districts that were red that were left in what we might call Northern Virginia proper. Of course, you know, there's always a debate about how far Northern Virginia extends. But um, those two um, islands of red have given way, like um, islands in the Chesapeake are giving way to sea level rise. They've given way to the, to the blue. And um, Northern Virginia is essentially not the story anymore. Um, and that's something significant and new in Virginia politics. And it, it's probably indicative of the entire state's movement in and of itself. Because um, it's also the case in this election that uh, Virginia really can't credibly be called a purple or competitive state anymore. Um, you can't call Virginia a competitive state when Democrats control the House, the Senate, all three um, statewide offices, the governor, the lieutenant governor, attorney general, both U.S. Senate seats, and picked up three congressional seats in last year's um, 2018 elections. It's really hard to call that a competitive state anymore. It's, it, it's essentially a blue state. It looks more like a mid-Atlantic blue state. It doesn't look like a northeastern blue state or a, or a midwestern uh, uh, blue state. It looks like, more like a you know, mid-Atlantic blue state. But um, you know, Virginia sort of seceded from the South in 2008. Um, and, that, and that secession has just be become permanent in some ways. So that's part of the story uh, from the last elections. Um, the other part of the story is where, where the electoral competition is shifted to. Um, the electoral competition is shifted to the western side, the southwestern, south and western side of Richmond. Um, very competitive sets of races there. And if you had told me five years ago, six years ago, um, let's say four years ago, if you told me four years ago when, when Glenn Sturdivant was first elected to the state senate, that four years later, the first Muslim woman would be elected to the Virginia state senate in that district, I would have told you you were crazy. Um, I just would have said there's no way in the world that the 10th senate district is going to elect a Muslim woman to the state senate. That says a lot about what's going on in that whole side of Richmond. Um, it, is, it is the case that Chesterfield is sort of a, uh, Chesterfield County is sort of schizophrenic in its politics right now. Part of Chesterfield County is rapidly evolving politically. Another part of Chesterfield County is not. Um, but nevertheless, that whole part of Richmond is rapidly evolving. Then Virginia Beach, I think, is probably the next battleground in, in Virginia politics, state, statewide uh, um, state politics. Um, Democrats have, for the last two, uh, three election cycles, targeted Virginia Beach. Um, they, uh, they were more successful than they probably expected to be in 2017. They were less successful than they expected to be in 2019. Um, but Virginia Beach is essentially where I think um, the political competition is going to shift. It's, it's, it's not going to be in Northern Virginia. It's going to shift down to um, uh, Richmond. It's going to shift down to Virginia Beach. And I think it's going to shift down to Virginia Beach in a pretty significant way. Um, I don't think, I think Democrats feel like they missed one in the 8th Senate District, like they should have been able to pick that up. Frank Wagner retiring, that was an open seat race. Um, they were probably reaching in the 7th. I'm sorry, I got those backwards. They were, they, uh, they were, uh, uh, thought they could pick up the seventh. They were reaching in the eighth. Um, they, they ended up not picking up either one of those. Um, the seventh is probably an R plus two, maybe, district. Um, all things being equal, the eighth is probably an R plus eight, R plus seven. Um, and so it was a reach in the eighth. 
Um, it was, uh, it was uh, uh, something they thought they could get with good turnout in the seventh. Um, I don't think they've given up on those. Um, I think we'll see that we'll see those districts come back in terms of the uh, where Democrats are going to focus their energies. Um, if you're from, if you're familiar with that Norfolk uh, Virginia Beach area, there, um, there's a string of House of Delegates uh, seats that sort of are, are right on the line between Norfolk and Virginia Beach um, that, that extend around into Chesapeake that. Democrats have targeted pretty intensely over the last couple of election cycles. They've been, they've been successful in picking them up. Um, Kelly Fowlers, for example, and others, and these are people who've never run for office before, came in and, 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 won, and won these races. That part of uh, Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, that area there is, um, is really fascinating politically because it is, it, a couple of things are going on there. Um, there's, there's a good bit of population churn going on there. And the population that's churning is, um, is not, um, it isn't people moving from another part of Hampton Roads to that area or another part of Virginia to that area. It's people moving that area who aren't from Virginia. And so it's sort of a microcosm of what, what has gone on in Northern Virginia. I mean, over the last couple of three decades, Northern Virginia has essentially become a majority non-Virginia region. More people live in Northern Virginia right now who are not from Virginia than are from Virginia. And that same sort of thing is happening in that sort of micro area of uh, the Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Chesapeake, if you sort of go from Regent University and wrap yourself around to the Hampton Roads Bridge Tunnel. There's a lot of population churn going on. That's part of what the story is. The other part of the story is there are a lot of college-educated women in, in that particular area who weren't politically active until 2016 and they became politically active as a result of the election of Donald Trump, and that essentially is what has triggered these, um, Senate, uh, these House district wins that Democrats have uh, picked up in 2017 and uh, triggered Democrats' interest in, be, in competing in those, uh, those areas of Virginia Beach. Um, there is uh, the, the western rural part of the state. The storyline tends to be the same as it has been for several years. Um, you know, uh, 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 politically, um, not a lot of movement really, you know, Shenandoah Valley down, um, you know, down through the southwest and then on the south side, not a lot of political change in terms of the general political makeup of the, uh, of the area, um, not a massive amount of um, electoral competition. Where you do see the kind of electoral competition that will happen in the rural area is the, uh, what I call, it's, a, it's an almost endangered species um, politically anymore, but it's the rural agrarian progressive or populist in the mold of a Tom Perriello um, who, who, can, who sort of comes from, um, comes from that culture. Um, it sort of speaks to the old FDR Republicans, the New Deal, uh, I'm sorry, FDR Democrats and New Deal Democrats, sort of the, the rural populist. Um, once in a while you see that um, um, kind of political competition uh, pop up in, in rural Virginia, but you don't see much beyond that. Um, Roanoke continues to be a democratic you know, city. It's not changing. Lynchburg continues to be a democratic city. It's not really changing. Beyond that, there's not a lot of political competition in south, southwest, south side Virginia. So the real action, I think, is shifting, uh, has shifted away from northern Virginia to the Richmond suburbs. Um, really the western suburbs. I don't think Hanover County is going to be competitive for a while. Um, um, the western side of Chesterfield, uh, eastern side of Chesterfield probably is not going to be competitive for a while um, unless Democrats can figure out how to uh, activate the Latino uh, population that lives in eastern Chesterfield. If they can figure out how to activate that population, it may make Chesterfield more competitive on the eastern side as well. Um, and uh, the competition has probably moved, shifted then also to Virginia Beach. I think as you look forward, that's where, um, where we're going to see this competition going forward. Um, issues. Um, what was fascinating about this last election is that um, it was essentially a nationalized election um, for the most part. Obviously, there were local issues that would pop up in, in any given race. Um, some races weren't nationalized, they were just local. Um, you know, and, and, and interestingly enough, it had, there's no rhyme or reason to it. You know, Martha Mugler's race 
um, um, in the 91st district to, to pick up that seat um, was largely a, just a, a race about local issues. Who was going to be able to represent the area better in the General Assembly? And if you had told me uh, four or five years ago that Pocosin would ever be represented by a Democrat, I would have told you I thought you were crazy. Um, and here we are with Pocosin um, now represented by a Democrat, Martha Mugler. Um, that is a result of that redistricting lawsuit. Um, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, issue sets, largely nationalized. Um, so this is another storyline about Virginia. Virginia has essentially become a part of the national political conversation uh, as far as both parties are concerned. Part of that is our geography. I mean, we're right next to Washington, D.C. As Virginia became more competitive politically, it made sense that all of these political organizations that have offices in Northern Virginia play in the Virginia races, right? And that's kind of what's happened. Um, it's easier to play in Virginia races for national organizations than it is for national organizations to play in Colorado races, even if they're there. It's just easier. You know, it's in your backyard. People live in Virginia. They think, you know, they understand it, so they play a little bit more in it. Um, so um, gun control was uh, a major issue. Climate change, um, uh, whatever you want to call it, global warming, climate change, whatever, was a major issue depending on where you were. Um, but but the, um, you know, the, uh, the, the 20 to 30 mile an hour wind, consistent wind that animated the elections was really the wind that blew out of the north from the White House. Um, anyone who's ever lived in a consistently windy area knows that um, you just sort of get used to it. It's like living next to the railroad tracks. You, you almost don't hear it, but of course you do. It's just in the background. And the wind that blew um, constantly was the wind of Donald Trump. I mean, that was sort of the, the wind that animated the elections. Um, we, so we think um, we did some polling um, third week of October looking at, um, looking at what was driving voters. So we were asking voters um, some questions about um, their views about Donald Trump and how enthusiastic they were, what issues they were following, how, how serious they were about those issues. And what we were trying to do is um, we were trying to drill down to the most likely voters in Virginia because four years ago in the off-off year elections, turnout was 29%. Presidential turnout has been 72%, right? So there's a big difference in, in what the electorate looks like between 29% and 72%. And so part of our, part of our challenge in polling is, is understanding what that 29% looks like um, and uh, not, not confusing it with the 72%. So, we, uh, so the, way, the way we do that is um, we, we ask voters a lot of questions about enthusiasm, about how much they're paying attention, whether they've been contacted by a campaign, have they given any money to a campaign, that kind of thing. A series of questions are about eight or ten questions that we ask, and then what we do is we score uh, respondents on every one of those answers. Um, we'll give them a point if they answer um, in one one way and a, and a zero, so it's a zero one binary score, um, and then we um, it's a sim sim simple additive index. We just add it up, right? So if we ask ten questions and uh, and a respondent answers posit positively to all ten of those then we consider them the most likely voter. And if they answer you know, three uh, positively on three of them but not on seven or the others, they get a score of three, we cut our scores off at seven, right? So if somebody answers seven, eight, nine, ten positively, then we consider them to be highly likely voters. And so when we did that um, in our, in our uh, mid-October poll, we came out with a projected turnout of 37%. And, and so what we did is we looked more really intensely at those 37% of respondents, at what issues they were concerned about, what they said they were interested in. Um, and we had projected, based upon that, a 13% uh, uh, Democratic enthusiasm over Republican enthusiasm for voting um, going into the elections. Um, what, is, what does that mean, right? What, what that means is that um, the 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 electorate that, of course, turnout obviously was higher than that. Turnout actually exceeded that. Um, it was, I think it's going to be about 42 or 43 um, percent. It's going to be in the 60s in some districts. But So turnout exceeded that. 
But what that means is the activated electorate right now is more inclined to support democratic um, um, in, uh, initiatives, democratic uh, issues, uh, generally across the state. And so, um, and so that's ultimately, just coming back full circle, that's, that's what makes Virginia right now a blue state. So if you're running off off your elections, and um, if you're running um, in an off off year election, you're probably running an election that looks more blue than it did four years ago or eight years ago, you know, the cycle of off off year elections. Couple other thoughts uh, about the elections. Um, I think at the end of the day, we're gonna have over 40 candidates who raised and spent over a million dollars. I, I can remember, you, you probably remember this better than I do, I can remember six, eight years ago when the storyline was we now have two or three Senate candidates that are raising and spending over a million dollars. And they were Northern Virginia candidates and it's because the media market was so expensive in Northern Virginia. And, um, and now I think we're gonna have eight or 10 that spent over a mil uh, $2 million, right? So um, these elections have become really expensive. Um, I think one out of every four dollars that was spent in Virginia's elections this year is gonna be from outside of Virginia. And I say that not because, oh, that's a lot of money from outside of Virginia, that's a lot of money inside Virginia. That's a lot of money that people in Virginia and organizations in Virginia are contributing to these elections. So the elections are becoming more expensive and that money is still coming from Virginia, in Virginia, which means that there's a lot of uh, increased interest in what's going on in Virginia. Um, another point is um, we had this redistricting lawsuit, the racial packing lawsuit that the Supreme Court let stand. Um, that affected a series of House of Delegates districts from um, just south of Richmond all the way through um, Hampton Roads. Some of them touched the, a couple of Virginia Beach House, uh, 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 House of Delegates districts a little bit, but it really sort of stopped at Norfolk. It didn't really um, have a big impact on Virginia Beach. Um, and that resulted in some Democratic pickups. Um, and, and actually, the, the volume of the, of the pickup was greater than I thought it was going to be. Um, as we all know, Chris Jones lost um, f a much bigger loss than I thought. I, I actually figured I wouldn't have been surprised if Chris Jones had won. Um, He's just known in the district. His family's been known in the district. You know, the, the Chris Jones family has had that pharmacy for a couple of generations. Um, and uh, there was a tell for me, though, about three weeks out. And it had nothing to do with, po with politics. It had nothing to do with polling. It had nothing to do with anything. Anybody live in the district, in Chris Jones' district? Anybody from there at all? A couple people? So about three weeks before the election, I don't know why I got this letter, but I got a letter from Chris Jones' pharmacy telling me that he had sold his pharmacy. He had sold his list to CBS. I thought, that's, that's really odd. Why, why, would, why would you do this three weeks before um, the most competitive race you've ever had in your life? All right? and, and, in, and initially, I just was caught off guard by that. As I thought about it, I realized, um, he probably knows what's coming. I mean, he's, you know, this is, this is sort of an indication of probably what's coming. And, and his loss was pretty dramatic. And, um, and his Democratic opponent, as far as I could tell, didn't start running seriously until early August. I don't think the Democratic caucus um, um, uh, on the House side really started funding his, the Democratic candidate until uh, seriously until August sometime. Um, so there was a round of polling that, that, that happened in, in late, mid to late August. And uh, in, that, in that round of polling, both, both sides do it, that round of polling, I think, drove a lot of money decisions on the part of both sides. And uh, that round of polling must have shown Chris Jones being in some pretty serious trouble. Um, and so obviously things, things shifted in that race. He lost bigger than I thought he would lose. Um, I, I didn't think uh, Shelley Simons would win as big as she won in, uh, in the 94th. I thought that would be a closer race. Um, and um, I, I think everybody sort of expected Martha Mugler would win. Um, that, the, the fundamentals of that district looked pretty, pretty serious. Um, so Democrats benefited from that court case. 
Um, and they benefited from that court case in a way that probably isn't going to go away anytime soon. Um, because the last and final thing I'll talk about is, um, is issues um, and what, what the elections might mean, right? So one of the things that we all know is coming up is redistricting. And um, um, while redistricting reform has not been a Democratic issue or a Republican issue, it's been a bipartisan issue, um, Democrats have, have been leading voices in advocating for redistricting reform over the last several years. Um, and so because they control both chambers and the governor's office, the governor's uh, mansion, it, 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 it's, un, it's inconceivable to me that any redistricting that happens is going to dramatically undo that court case. It is interesting to me, I was on a radio show the morning after the election, and Governor McAuliffe was on the show. And it wasn't me, but one of the other, uh, one of the other guests on the show was asking Governor McAuliffe about redistricting reform. And he hesitated on it. Well, I'm not sure, you know, I'd have to look at that, you know, bill that the General Assembly passed last time. I'm not comfortable with the idea of the Supreme Court being involved you know, because I think the Supreme Court is a partisan Supreme Court. You know, all these judges have been put on, on the Supreme Court by the Republicans. And I, so I, I picked up on that and I said, well, Governor, how widespread is that hesitation? And he didn't back down. He said, well, I think, you know, we have to look at it. We have to look to see. And that sort of raised my tentacles because I'm thinking, well, I don't, would Democrats really start backing off redistricting reform? Because they have the majority now. Um, if I had to guess, it would, it's still going to pass the General Assembly because I think you're suddenly also going to find a lot of Republicans who support it, um, who didn't support it um, prior to this. And so you probably could cobble together a, a majority, a bipartisan majority. But it would be really interesting if, um, if Democrats um, are suddenly less interested in redistricting reform because they have this majority. Um, and could there be an argument, here's what I think is Here's what I think is germinating in, in Governor McAuliffe's mind, um, although I would hate, for, you know, he can, he can say what he wants to say about what he's thinking, but what I'm hearing from him is perhaps if we passed a different bill, right, you, in order to change the Constitution, you have to pass a bill, have an election, pass the exact same bill, then it goes to the voters, right? So perhaps we delay one round on this, pass a better redistricting uh, reform bill, better in, in McAuliffe's own mind, um, in the next cycle of, of session, election session, and, and that gives us Democrats the opportunity to redistrict on our own one last time. Um, that's super cynical, um, but I can't figure out why he would hesitate like he did. Um, and then on the progressive side of the Democratic um, caucus, you're hearing voices now say, um, you're hearing elected, reelected, newly elected Democrats say, why should we put a commission together that puts Republicans on the commission that gerrymandered us for the last two decades? So I, I actually am really fascinated by this redistricting you know, fight that might be coming, re this redistricting reform fight that might be coming. Um, and, um, you know, it, it may not be a fight, but it just is, it, there's, there's some rumbling going on uh, behind the scenes over all of this. So, um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and just open it up because I think there are probably lots of uh, questions, answers. You, you all may have your own thoughts about some of this stuff. Um, you, you pay attention to all this as much as I do. So, and I will just say I appreciate what all of you do. I have some of the former students in here in the crowd. Um, I appreciate what you all do. Um, somebody asked me one time about voting and, uh, and like citizens, the obligation and the right to vote, that, that sort of thing. And I said, uh, in the, it was in the context of polling. If you ask people if they're going to vote, the reason we ask these 10 questions about, uh, uh, from people about enthusiasm is if you just ask them are they going to vote, 85% of people are going to say they're going to vote. And somebody asked me one time, well, why is that? And I said, well, um, every time somebody asks me if I'm going to vote, I hear the voice of Mr. Hubbard in my head. Um, and Mr. Hubbard was my civics teacher who drilled into us, it's our obligation and our duty as citizens to vote, et cetera, et cetera. So if I were to say, 
no, I'm not going to vote. I would just, Mr. Hubbard's image would be, appear in my head frowning at me, right? And so, um, and so you know, uh, that's, that, that's um, so, you, you know, you, you've got thousands of kids who are going to have the image of you in their heads for the rest of their lives think, thinking, I, I got to go vote. You may like that or not like that, but, uh, but Mr. Hubbard will always be, the image of Mr. Hubbard will always be in my head. So, all right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there and open it up. And I'll repeat a question um, so that everyone can hear it. A question if nobody else wants to start, I'll start. Uh, <laughs> my question is, is how do you do polling now, now that you know, we don't all have landlines and we're tired of picking up the phone from the robocalls and everything else? Right. So why would I even want to participate in polling, et cetera, et cetera? So the question is, how, how do we do polling in, in this day and age? Um, it's a good question. Uh, the short answer is it's increasingly hard, um, but um, so we still do uh, live call polling. So we still have um, people, you know, talking to you. It's not a computer. It's actually 100, 110 students that work in our survey lab um, every night. They're calling from five to nine, Monday through Friday, and we don't call on Saturdays. It's a horrible day to do polling, and then we call on Sundays. Um, from 11 to 7. Um, so um, we, uh, we do call cell phones and we do call landlines. In Virginia right now, about 65% of people are cell phone, mostly or only users, and about 35% of people are um, cell phone, landline, uh, both users. Um, and so what we do is when we buy a sample, um, so there are there are you know, millions of registered voters in Virginia, and we can buy um, lists of phone numbers. We can buy lists of, of information about those voters. And so what we do is we randomly draw, if we're gonna do a, a, a statewide survey of 1,000 people, we'll randomly draw um, 1,000 names and phone numbers off that list. So we put the theory of probability into the practice. We randomly draw those 35,000. We, uh, we quota up front, we quota that random draw, so we quota it 65% cell phone, 35% um, landline. We also up front quota that, uh, that random draw so that it is uh, weighted more heavily toward younger, um, uh, younger people as opposed to older people. So I'll draw a sample um, of, uh, that is 25% under 30. Right, and then uh, because, I'll, and I'll explain why. But uh, so we ran, we quota on age, we don't quota on sex, we quota on um, on region. So we do a quota a quota draw on region. So we represent the region uh, regions of Virginia ran, uh, randomly uh, with a quota imposed, and then uh, and then we scramble all of those numbers, and then we just randomly draw a uh, call them right. So. Um, Somebody may pick up the phone the first time and they may say, you know, I don't want to take the survey, in which case we would, we would, we would dump them. We, we, we would just code them as, um, as refused and we would dump them. But you may not pick up the phone the first time. It may go to voicemail. And if it goes to voicemail, we'll code you as voicemail and we'll call that number back uh, up to five times. So we'll give up to five times to try that number. Not five times in a row, by the way. Um, so what we do is we delay call by a day. So if you don't pick up one day, then we'll delay call you again the next day. We'll do that for five times. Um, and, um, and then if you pick up the phone and you start talking to us and something happens and we get disconnected, then we'll code you that way and we'll call you right back to try to continue that, uh, that conversation. We end up um, having to call about 35,000 numbers to get 1,000 people to participate in a survey. Um, it, it is a lot of, it's just a, you know, it's the nature of, of the beast right now. Our biggest enemy right now is spoofing. It, uh, that's what's hurting us the most right now because, um, you know, how many, you, you all get, you know, 500 calls a day. Maybe not that many. I block as much as I can. Um, but we all, get, we all get those calls, right? And, and so you're loath to pick up your phone because you just, you know, you don't know the number. So we, um, since we're a state institution, we have the benefit of being able to tag our phone line uh, to read Commonwealth of Virginia or Christopher Newport University. 
And that, we, that actually helps us um, because people w are more willing to pick up the phone if it says comma. It depends on, I don't know why, I can't explain this part, but in some parts of the state it has to say Commonwealth of Virginia. In other parts of the state it can say Christopher Newport <laughs> University. It has to do with the phone, phone companies um, and, the, and the cell phone companies. So that helps us, that helps people, um, you know, people are willing to pick up the phone um, for that reason. Um, we, uh, we are, uh, it is illegal, it's a federal law, a federal crime for a computer to dial a cell phone, even though it happens with these spoofing calls all the time. So we disable our auto dial function so the students have to dial manually these numbers because we don't, we don't know which number is cell or, or landline. They don't know and so we don't want any students to inadvertently break the law, so we make them manually dial every number. Um, and, then they, and then they basically, you know, ask the questions. Um, at the end, we, so I said we quota up front, but at the end, we're, we're going to get, um, if we're lucky, 8 to 10% of our respondents are going to be under 30. And that's not the reflection of the voting population of Virginia, and so we end up, having to back end weight our results to reflect the voting population of Virginia. And this is where the art of the polling comes in, right? So the science of it is all what I described up front. The art of it is, well, what is the electorate gonna look like in any given election? Is it gonna be more male than female? Is it gonna be younger? Is it gonna be older? You know, um, some demographics are pretty consistent in elections. 19 to 21 percent of the electorate in almost any given election, statewide election, is going to be African American. It's a pretty predictable, consistent number. Typically, 51 to 52 percent of the electorate is going to be a woman, 48, 49 percent man. Pretty consistent. But sometimes there's just massive turnout in Northern Virginia and less turnout in Southwest Southside. And so if I weighed it, to be 35% Northern Virginia, 27, 28% Southwest Southside, and it ends up being 40% Northern Virginia and you know 22% Southwest Southside. It makes the um, it it makes the results look different than than what they're going to actually look like on election day. So the real art, the challenge of polling is um, is the back end weighting. That's really where you where that's where you're going to you're gonna look at particular polling and you're gonna say, okay, this is their model of what they think the electric, electorate is gonna look like. This is the model. And, um, and so it really requires you to sort of pay attention to what's going on on the ground, what's happening, um, talking. I'm constantly talking to people on both the R&D side, sort of getting, getting their sense of what's going on, what they're doing, what they're trying to do. Um, because the because the, where you're going to flame out or where you're going to really be successful is on that back end waiting. That's your model of what you think the electorate is going to be. So that's sort of how that's done. Um, and uh, you know, uh, um, you know, knock on wood, uh, last couple of election cycles we've done we've been really accurate. Uh, we projected a 13 percent Democratic enthusiasm over Republican enthusiasm in the third week of October. Um, statewide, Democratic turn, uh, vote was about 13% higher than Republican vote, so we were right on on that. Um, and, um, you know, but there, just, as, just as often as you're right on, you're going to be completely wrong sometimes. Um, last, in 2018, we called the, uh, we called the, uh, the, uh, the Comstock uh, Wexton race right on, we called the Spanberger Brat race right on, and we were completely off on the Luria Taylor race. Totally blew that. Um, and that's that whole changing Virginia Beach political landscape that was, that was really hard to get our minds around what was really going on and what the electorate was really going to look like in Virginia Beach. So sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. It's just an, it's the nature of the game. You've got to take your lumps <laughs> along with everything else. So, yeah? So are, am I aware of who uses the, our data? Uh, we just put it out publicly. Um, we don't, so we don't give our raw data to anybody, um, but we put our results out publicly. And you know, I, people from all over the place use it. Um, we, we just consider uh, the raw data to be our own intellectual property, um, so we don't, um, we don't release it. Um, if somebody FOIA'd us, we're a state agency, so if somebody FOIA'd us, and wanted our raw data, we could legitimately say, you know, for intellectual um, uh, research purposes, 
we're going to claim an embargo period on that data, and we would claim an embargo period past the election, um, and just so people couldn't use that for purposes of partisan, you know, benefit in any way. Um, and and I've already cleared that through our university attorney, so that would be okay to do that. <laughs> yeah. Lawsuits. Um, I, there, uh, there, I don't anticipate any lawsuits um, over the 2011 redistricting anymore, uh, just because we're coming up on the 2021 round of redistricting. Um, depending on what happens there, sure, we could have lawsuits um, that, that come out of the 2021 redistricting um, uh, round. In fact, I would argue that um, if Democrats just do it the old-fashioned way, um, it's less likely to result in lawsuits than if the commission is created and it's done that way because, um, because every, in most other states where commissions have been created, there, there's been uh, litigation over those commissions. Um, and so there probably is more likely to be litigation if there's a commission that's created to do it than if Democrats just do it the old fashioned way, I would think. Yeah, I, all the way in the back, yeah. So the question is about um, about the level of partisanship between the two main parties and whether there is an opportunity essentially for a third party. Um, I, I just don't see opportunity for third party um, um, for third parties uh, to do much better than they have already been doing in Virginia. Quite frankly, um, part of that is um, part of that is structural. Um, part of that is the nature of the of our political party system. Part of that is our political culture. Um, we have, uh, Virginia has a very paternalistic political culture um, and it doesn't lend itself to third parties. Um, um, you know, you go out west where you have a more libertarian political culture and you're gonna find really active third parties. Um, even then, they don't, they're not, they're not enough, big enough to actually control much um, uh, in terms of statewide offices or things like that. I mean, you'll get libertarians and greens that will win local races in, you know, uh, in places out west, Colorado, Nevada, et cetera, California sometimes. Um, um, but, then, but then they struggle statewide. And, and, and so no, the short answer is no. Um, we, uh, our, our political parties, despite whatever, um, whatever one side will say about the other side, our political parties are largely bigger tent parties, and um, our political parties um, practice um, Darwinianism in the most entrepreneurial way possible. Um, the moment that, that either party sees a faction or a, or a group emerge outside of their umbrella that they think would fit into their umbrella, they'll bring it in, right? And they'll evolve their shape and, and what they look like. And sometimes that's to the detriment of them um, in the short term or in the long term, and sometimes it's to their benefit. So um, Republicans have really suffered negatively for being that way. Republicans have suffered negatively for allowing you know, ideological extremes to, 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 to come under the big tent and, and mainstream them. Um, you know, that's what's happened in Virginia, essentially. I mean, when, 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 the, when, the, when the mainstream candidates in Virginia are Corey Stewart and E.W. Jackson, you, you're probably in trouble, right? Um, so, so these political parties um, evolve and, and, and shape and reshape themselves. A really fascinating question for me is, um, what's the Democratic Party in Virginia gonna look like in four, six, eight years? Um, because there is clearly a progressive um, energy uh, on, in the Democratic Party right now, in the Democratic coalition, and that, and that progressive energy includes a Democratic Socialist, um, right? So it includes, uh, it includes people um, with, with some, some views that are, are what I would call um, militantly partisan, 
We've seen that on the Republican side for a while. On the Democratic side, I hear those voices. How much does the Democratic coalition of Virginia evolve and, and, and look differently because of that? Um, but because those party, because the parties are willing to evolve, it makes it almost impossible for a third party to organize itself coherently enough over a series of elections in order to build a winning coalition. Because the moment a third party starts to build a winning coalition, one of the two major parties is going to pick off parts of it. And that makes it almost impossible for a third party. Yeah, right? Yep. Yeah, so the, so the question is about um, Prince William County in particular sort of sh swinging, you know, from a Bob Marshall Republican to a Lee Carter Democratic Socialist, right? So is that swing the norm? And that, that's probably the extreme, actually. Those are probably the, the, the extreme examples of, of, the, of the parties. I mean, could, could a Lee Carter get elected in Hampton Roads? Could a Lee Carter get elected in... Suburban Richmond, um, could, I would have, could have Lee Carter have gotten elected in Prince William County, you know, six years ago. Um, so I don't, I don't, I don't think this blue wave, what what drives the blue wave? Quite frankly, um, is actually pretty moderate stuff. Um, what drives the blue wave is um, good schools, safe streets, um, stuff like that. And what's driven the blue wave in the last couple of election cycles are college-educated women. And college-educated women uh, aren't typically the most radical people um, on the planet. Um, they're driving the blue wave. And then you get these, um, you get these sort of ex extremes that'll pop up, that'll do well. Um, but that, that's not what's driving the blue wave. The question is, in my mind, um, can that blue wave be ridden by some um, more um, extreme elements in, in such a way that they can shape the larger narrative of democratic politics, like we saw ha ha we've seen happen on the Republican side over the last couple of decades. Um, and I don't know the answer to that, but that's that's sort of the question, right? Yeah, uh, let me go to somebody new. Yeah. Um, are you seeing a larger like with the data that you're gathering over the last few years? Are you seeing a larger group of independent voters due to like the the increased polarization of both parties, like the, obviously the Republican Party is moving further to the left, or to the right, the Democratic Party is <coughs> moving further to the left. It seems, in my mind, that that would equate for more independent and undecided voters because there is such a lack of a, a moderate centrist party. Right. So the question is are, is, are there more moderate independent voters because of the, polars, the, the increased polarization of the two parties? And the answer, oddly enough, is no. The answer is more democratic identifying voters, especially post-2016. I mean, the best thing that have ever happened to the Virginia Democratic Party was the election of Donald Trump. Um, you know, within, within a day or two of the election of Trump, um, I, get, I get emails from you know, all kinds of people, all kinds of groups. Um, within two or three days of the election of Donald Trump, I got my first email from a group called Peninsula Indivisible. Um, and then within a few days after that, I got a, an email from a group um, that ultimately ended up being really powerful politically, the liberal women of Chesterfield County. Um, those, those are representatives of all of these indivisible and resistance groups that emerged, not only in Virginia, but around the country. But in Virginia, they really emerged. And um, they, resulted in, um, they resulted in the big pickups Democrats got in 2017. All of those, oh, I'm not, I'm generalizing here, but a lot of that was previously not politically engaged women um, who might have previously said, I'm an independent or I'm a moderate when we talk to them in a poll, who now identify as democratic because they are so engage, in, engaged by Trump and Trumpism. 
And so we're seeing less of that now than we were because of Trump. Trump is that, again, that wind that blows out of the north steadily and has animated politics in Virginia for the last several years. Yep. I have a question. From, uh, on the issue of gun control, yep. and, I'm just, and I'm not going either way, in my section of Virginia, we have a county that just last week voted to be a sanctuary county for the Second Amendment. Yep. Do you see other counties going the same way, or, I mean, just, what do you think is going to happen in the, in the Commonwealth? Well, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, what's going to happen across the Commonwealth in terms of uh, gun control? Um, so um, is there going to be, let me start by this, saying this. There is why we've been polling on gun control for nearly a decade. There is massive and widespread support for gun control measures, um, closing the gun show loophole, probably polls at 85%. Red flag laws, um, probably polls at 85, 90%. And we're in the field right now with a poll where we're asking some of these questions because we think they're going to come up in the General Assembly session. Um, closing the gun show loophole, 85%. Um, uh, banning assault weapons, 80%. Lots of support across Virginia for so a lot of these gun control measures. Um, will, these, will these get uh, through the General Assembly? Um, I, could clear, I could easily see some of these things getting through the General Assembly. Um, will that then result in a reaction on the part of some rural areas? I could easily see that happening. Easily see that happening. Um, um, in, fa in fact, um, one, thing, one thing that may come out of uh, this, the legislative session, and I'm, I'm sitting here talking, I mean, uh, not that I know anything more than Senator Marsden does, but one thing that may come out of the General Assembly is, right, so, Democrats have had a difficult time getting around, getting their, getting um, intellectually working their way around um, this kind of an argument, right? So um, monuments, right? A city can't take down a monument. It has, it requires the General Assembly to say that they can take down a monument. Cities can't enact city-level gun control measures. So one of the things the General Assembly, uh, I could easily see them doing, is to say, look. We're going to recognize that rural Virginia may feel one way about gun control and urban and suburban Virginia may feel another way. So we're just going to let cities have more authority to enact some gun control measures if they want them, right? So the city of Richmond may want to have pretty stringent, and the city of Norfolk may want to have pretty stringent gun control laws, um, but, you know, Buchanan County may not, or, or Wise County may not, right? So let's actually create a law that allows lo more local authority over, over how they do gun control. Um, that may be more palatable politically than saying, we're going we're gonna, to uh, create a, you know, a ban on assault weapons across Virginia or something like that. So you, I could easily see something like that coming out of the General Assembly session. So is the blue wave permanent, uh, more, nothing is permanent, but is the blue wave more permanent or is it, is it a temporary phenomenon of, of Donald Trump? Um, so I, I would say it's probably more sustaining than, than not, and here's why I would say that. The blue wave that we've seen in 17, 18, and now 19 was built upon a pretty solid foundation of Democratic gains in Northern Virginia in particular. Um, and, um, and so I don't, I have a hard time seeing that be, uh, undone very quickly. Um, however, we're in a reactionary phase of politics nationally. So if, um, if Elizabeth Warren is elected president next year, you're going to see just as much energy on the Republican side animated by Elizabeth Warren against her as you've seen on the Democratic side animated against Donald Trump over the last several years. And that will have an impact on Virginia. I mean, it just will. You'll see the effects of that in Virginia. Um, we saw it in, uh, fr from 2008 on, right? I mean, um, we, you know, we saw Republicans in Virginia get really excited and animated and energized um, uh, against Barack Obama to the point where it almost cost Mark Warner his Senate seat 
I mean, you know, um, it just, Ed Gillespie's a, a good candidate, campaigner and all that kind of stuff, but Mark Warner left office with the highest approval ratings of any governor since public opinion has been taken, and he barely won re-election um, when he ran against, uh, when Ed Gillespie ran against him, and it was all Barack Obama. It was all Republican voters animated about Barack Obama and Democratic voters chagrined and sitting home, right? So you, we're clearly in this um, reactionary um, cycle in politics nationally. You see that in Virginia, but Democrats have been making steady gains in Northern Virginia um, for decades, and, and I don't think that is going to be undone by anything that is reactionary. Yeah. I live in the 90th district. Unopposed is a great candidate. Yep. Seems to be the only candidate. Is that going to be more and more prevalent? Um, so it's it's interesting. So the question is about unopposed um, uh, 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 incumbents running unopposed. Um, so as much as we're talking about this exciting election, it is the case that a third of the Commonwealth geographically had no competitive election this last cycle. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, we got all, all that we got in this last election cycle out of two-thirds geographically of the, of the Commonwealth having competitive elections. I think there were 25 Democrats that run, ran unopposed, which is completely mind-boggling because it used to be the other way around. 25 Republicans have run unopposed. Um, it, the sad reality is, yeah. Um, you know, I have a hard time seeing, um, I have a hard time seeing um, an, uh, elections going forward looking any differently than they've looked in the past in terms of competitive, non-competitive percentages, you know, third, two-thirds type thing. Um, the reality is, and here's why, it, it, it's nothing nefarious um, for the most part. Um, urban areas are very Democratic. Rural areas are very Republican. It's hard, um, it's hard to draw competitive lines in Southwest Virginia. It just is. It's really hard. And it's hard to draw competitive lines in Norfolk or in Richmond or in Newport News. Um, and so you're going to get a certain percentage of districts that are just not competitive. And where the battles are in, are in those urban-leaning suburban and rural-leaning suburban areas. That's where the battlegrounds are. That's where basically politics is dictated in Virginia. And right now, Democrats are doing well in those urban-leaning suburban and rural-leaning suburban areas. Um, pr prior to that, Republicans. I mean, that's the way Republicans rose to power is they were doing well in those areas. And, but the reality is you're just not going to draw competitive lines in really urban areas and in real rural areas. And so because of that, you're, gonna, you're not going to have competitive races in probably a third geographically of the Commonwealth. That's just the way it always is. And that isn't nefarious. That's just, you know, we, we, we're sorting. We sort, right? People, you know, people move. People, you know, there's the great sort is, has been going on, and, and it's, it is a reality. I don't know how much time we have, so you tell me. Okay, all right, so we're, we're good. Any other... Very back. <coughs> yep. Uh, in your polling, have you looked at the some of the social media news and what aspects that is? Yeah. Kind of her thoughts and the whole idea of fake news and what's fair and balanced out there, and if you're getting your media from Facebook, how is that actually influencing not just the discourse but the situation? Yeah. So the question relates to social media and whether we've polled on it. Um, we, um, we, did, we have included questions on news source um, and trusting of news over the years. We did a study a few years back that looked at um, millennials in Virginia, the, the politics of millennials, and one of the big sections of that, uh, research, re that report was on uh, where they get their news. Um, and it was pre, um, you know, the 2016 Russia, all that stuff. But, uh, you know, very few... Um, how many of you watch pretty consistently every evening ABC, NBC, or CBS News, right? Maybe 15% of you, um, and Jim. <laughs> Maybe 15% of you, right? So, um, yeah, I'm, now, not, I'm, so ABC, NBC, and CBS are the three traditional news networks. Um, and they, they've been, you know, running their news broadcasts at, you know, 6.30 or 
7 o'clock, whatever it is, 6, 6.30, every night for, since we've had TV. Um, that's traditional news. So when you say where people are getting their news sources and social media and all that, um, that essentially is traditional news anymore. Um, how many of you watch CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, something like that? Um, about another 20%? And how many of you get your news primarily on an online source, whether you, you would consider it credible, right? right? Um, go, go ahead, be, you can be honest. I mean, I, I see all those, right? Probably half or more of you are saying um, that you get your news from some online source that you consider credible, right? So about 15% traditional news, MSNBC, NBC, ABC, CBS, about 20% the, the, the three major cable networks, and then the rest of you online. Um, that pretty much is what Virginia looks like. Um, more, than, more than half um, of, of people now get their news online. That's just the way they get their news. And so um, that, that just is what it is. I'm, I, don't, I, I don't have any comments on whether it's good or bad because it just is reality. It's not going away. By the way, how many of you read a, a, a newspaper every morning? Right? So 10% of you read a newspaper every morning. Uh, <laughs> Physical, uh, I'm sorry, how many of you read a physical paper, newspaper every morning? Oh, whoa, suddenly some hands go down, right? But how many of you read a newspaper that otherwise prints itself also, but you read it online? Right, so, all right, so maybe 40% of you are digital newspaper reader, readers. So, um, but, but look, 10% or less of you are physically going out every day and picking up a newspaper and reading it. Right. All right. There was there were a couple other. Yeah. Uh, what were the top three or four issues outside of the Trump factor that led people to Top three or four issues in this last election um, outside of the Trump factor. Um, gun control, I think, was the biggest issue. Um, and outside of, out, um, I think gun control was the biggest issue. Um, but this may surprise you, just because the, the main, you know, the main sort of the thought was gun control, etc. School funding um, was was um, among the top. This may surprise you. School funding was among the top issues. If you um, if you if you sort of dug dug below some of the um, some of the um, uh, the uh, uh, issues that that national groups are trying to animate, um, uh, school funding was one of the top issues. And um, climate change, um, environmental issues generally was an important issue. Um, transportation for one of the first elections that I can remember was not one of those big issues. It was one of those issues that would come up, but it wasn't one of those issues that drove people to town halls and things like that. Um, depending on where you are, um, Crime and public safety was an issue. But I think the top issues, I don't know if there are four, I think the top issues were gun control, school funding, um, and, um, and some environmental climate type issues. And that takes different forms and shapes depending on where you are. If you're out in, you know, in, the, in the western rural part of the state, it might take the, take the shape of the pipeline um, uh, protest. Actually, there's some of that up in northern Virginia as well. If you're in Hampton Roads, um, it's the pipeline and it's um, uh, sea level rise, that sort of stuff. Um, so, so it just depended on what shape environment, environmentalism took. Um, I, I moderated probably a dozen town halls and uh, moderated a couple of debates. And, uh, and I, I, sort of, I knew that there was, there was concern about uh, school funding and education. Um, I, I didn't quite understand how deeply it went until I started hearing it over and over again. And it made sense to me after about the eighth or ninth one, it made sense to me because I made the connection between um, the, uh, the uh, activated female vote and a lot of those were, are actually school teachers or related to school teachers or they're really engaged in their kids in school. And so it made sense that school funding um, and schools generally were one of those big issues. That's what I'd say, yeah, yeah. Healthcare, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Healthcare, healthcare was one of the was was also one of those top issues. It took different shapes and forms also. Um, um, so I, I try in my mind to separate what, what were the nationally driven narratives and issues versus the local issues. And Medicaid, healthcare was certainly one of those. Um, and, and also healthcare took a, a, an odd shape because um, I, I was completely uh, beside myself, certainly not more than Terry McAuliffe and other Democrats were, when Chris Jones and some other Republicans started running on, I, I voted to expand. <laughs> <laughs> and Medicaid in Virginia. I think people were stunned by the, that Republicans would do that. Um, and, um, and so it took different forms and different, different shapes, but healthcare certainly animated a lot. Um, I, I would agree that was certainly one of those top issues. Another, th that makes me think of something else. Another, um, from a tactical perspective, um, and this is a case where Virginia was a test case for 2020. Um, we saw more direct mail um, in Virginia this year than we've seen in a long time. I, um, I counted, um, I think at the end of the day, I had 92 direct mail pieces. Um, and I, I live in the 94th, the Simons Yancey race. I must come up on both the Democrats and Republicans um, likely voter um, models pretty high because I was getting both, um, you know, both Yancey and Simons direct mailers and outside group direct mailers. 94, I think, is what um, I had at the end of the day. And I kept them all um, just because, you know, that's what I do. Um, <laughs> so, um, but what happened is when I started, when I was getting so many, I, I started asking people about them. And what I, what I heard was that both sides um, were, were uh, testing um, messages and direct mail targeting uh, models. Um, national groups were testing direct mail targeting models because I think in 2020 we're going to see uh, direct mail become a big thing. And one um, Republican strategist that I know, um, a former student of mine who who, uh, who works for the RNC, said to me that um, they uh, they have come to the conclusion that social media is important, yes, et cetera, et cetera. But people are figuring out how to how to avoid it if they don't want to see it. But if they get a piece of mail in their mailbox, they at least have to pick it up to throw it away. Um, and so if you inundate them with enough, every time they pick it up and they see that same message, so-and-so is evil, <laughs> then, um, then it has a psychological effect on them. <laughs> uh, what about the non-session? Um, I think the non-session, you mean, I guess you're, the question is what about the non-gun control session? And I think your question is did that really um, hurt Republicans? Um, and uh, I think the answer is yes. I, I think Republicans made a tactical mistake by, by stopping the session after 90 minutes and not doing anything. Um, now, here, here's the, I don't think it converted any uh, Republican to be a Democratic voter, but what it did is it added energy to an otherwise uh, ho-hum Democratic voter who got really concerned about, uh, 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 about gun control. And in particular, again, there's a, there's a linkage between some of these. Like the, what animated the Democratic base is these college-educated women. College-educated women tend to be more connected to the school system more, and care more about the school system. And gun, uh, gun safety has become a school safety issue. And so there was a, there was a connection between all of those issues with voters that were, if they were going to vote, they were going to vote Democratic. The question is, were they going to vote? And by shutting that session down, um, like Republicans did, I think they basically just thumbed their nose at a lot of voters um, who, who went, all right, I'm, that is, I'm not good with that. I don't like that. Um, that just added a little bit of momentum to me. So I do think it was a mistake tactically. Um, but I mean, I don't, uh, you know, I don't know why, I don't know what their thinking was, um, but I do think it was a mistake tactically. You probably know what their thinking was better than I do. Um, so one, any, one last, I think there was, all right, way in the back, I'm trying to not lose, all right, I, I see you.
Gen Z. So the question is, what, um, what are millennials going to look like politically as they age? Um, and what, is Gen, what does Gen Z look like? We know far less about Gen Z because we have three years of Gen Z voters um, at this point. Um, and, and so it's hard to sort of know exactly. Um, millennials, we know a lot about millennials. Millennials, I think as of next year, will be the largest polit uh, politically active generation as baby boomers continue to die off. Um, I believe millennials have become the largest. <laughs> I mean, it is true. As, 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 ba as, <laughs> as baby boomers retire from, however. <laughs> Take two, right. So I, millennials are the biggest politically active generation. I think there are 83, 000, 83 million millennials. Um, they're the biggest um, politically active generation. Millennials are an interesting group, right? They're, they are very, um, they are very socially liberal. Um, so, you know, the idea that, you know, gay marriage and, you know, any issues like that would have ever been a problem is alien to them. Um, they're they're uh, very interested in, uh, in, in, you know, legalizing uh, marijuana, decriminalizing marijuana, whatever you say. Um, they're, very, um, they're very progressive on, on things like climate change and, what, and, and whether there should be action in, in, in that context. They also, however, um, are very libertarian mind oriented when it comes to things um, like personal choice and stuff like that. Um, so there, there's a very strong libertarian streak in millennials as well. And that, that, that very strong libertarian streak leans over into a personal responsibility um, characteristic of millennials that's interesting. So millennials um, will, for example, say, well, look, um, it's your debt. You, you knew you were acquiring it, you need to pay it when it comes to student loan debt, for example. Um, millennials um, will actually, um, are very conscious about that kind of personal responsibility stuff. And so I say that to say the, the things that animate politics right now um, make millennials uh, very inclined to be Democratic voters. But there may be things that animate politics 10 or 15 or 20 years from now that actually lean on the libertarian social, uh, personal responsibility side of millennials that make them more inclined to be Republican voters. Um, there is a concept in political science called um, generational replacement, which we're seeing with the, with the, um, with the mig migration out of active politics of baby boomers. How's that? Um, <laughs> and the, and the, the migration into politics of millennials. But there's also something, um, there's also something um, there's also a concept of generational political change. So within a generation, political change. So I'll give you an example of that. Baby boomers were the, the progressive you know, uh, group of, uh, 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 baby boomers were the progressive generation that changed po politics in America as it related to civil rights, women's rights, you know, all that sort of stuff, right? They were, they were you know, um, you know, marching against the man in the 60s and 70s. They right now are the biggest conservative voting bloc there is who doesn't want to change anything because they want to make sure that their retirement is in place and their, everything that they need is, is set. And they're fighting. We have this generational fight going on with, between baby boomers and millennials. Millennials are trying to force change, right? So um, the, most con uh, the generation most concerned about crime, baby boomers. The generation least inclined to want to support um, expanded you know, gay rights, for example, baby boomers. The generation least inclined to want to decriminalize um, marijuana, for example, baby boomers, right? So it Why just, they smoke? huh? Why they smoke? Well, exactly, <laughs> right. So no, that's right. So generations can change. Generations can uh, evolve themselves. So, Democrats would make a mistake, I think, to think, oh, well, we've got this generation of millennials and they're always going to be with us. Because what was a conservative Republican in 1982 doesn't even think, many of them don't even think they have a home in today's Republican Party. The Reagan Republicans of 1982 are, are not comfortable with the Republican Party of today. 
parties change, generations change, and so to, you know, nobody should ever think they've locked a generation in because the moment they do that, they're gonna wake up and go, politics have completely changed, that generation is gone, where did my party go, right? Um, and so, so that's what I would have to say about that. I'm, I'm getting the word, right? Yeah, there we go. <laughs> Quentin, thank you. Yeah. Just respect. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah.